Okay, welcome everybody to another Science Demystified with Dr. Joe Schwartz. Take it away, Dr. Joe. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I think we've got a really interesting topic for you uh, today because we are going to talk about the history of medicine. Now, let's face it, health is the most important thing in our life, right? And uh, whatever medicine can do for us is very much appreciated. But it's a fascinating and a very long history. Obviously, it's only possible to look at some of the highlights as we cruise through uh, the history. Where do we start? I think there can be no question that the first uh, attempts to treat disease were with uh, plant products, with herbs. And this probably goes back to the era of the caveman let's face it, what, what else would they be able to do? Uh, and uh, they experimented, uh, undoubtedly many succumbed to poisonous substances before some of the valuable ones were revealed. Very likely one of the first ever used was the poppy, the opium poppy. And before that bursts into, into bloom, the pod, if it is scored, will release this white juice. That white juice contains a number of compounds. We call them collectively opioids. The most famous one, of course, is morphine, which is a great painkiller. It's impossible to know exactly when this was first recognized as a useful medication, but probably five, 6,000 years BC. Uh, that's, that's the guess. Now, there are all kinds of, of um, paintings and sculptures that supposedly document the use of, uh, of opium. Here's one. This is an ancient Mesopotamian relief. And uh, it is said to be a medicine man who is carrying poppies. It's somewhat controversial because there are those who say that he's not actually carrying poppies here, he's carrying pomegranate fruit. So it's hard to know exactly when it started, but sometime you know, the, in the fifth millennia or so BC, there is evidence that they were already using the juice of, of the poppy. Now, besides drugs, the other main medical intervention, of course, is, is surgery. And uh, obviously uh, surgery at any kind of a significant uh, level uh, came much, much, much later. Uh, but some of the early forms of, of surgery were fascinating. Trepanation, they would drill a hole into the skull. And this was to treat, I guess, what we, today we would call mental disease. If uh, you know pe people behaved in some sort of a strange fashion, it was believed that they were somehow haunted by spirits or spirits had taken over their body and had to be released. And what is quite amazing is that some of these people who had holes drilled in their skull, and again, this, this go back, goes back way before uh, AD, some of these actually survived. And we know that because you can see the healing around the, uh, the holes that were drilled into, into the skull. So it's pretty primitive, uh, primitive surgery. <clears throat> the ancient Chinese uh, had all kinds of interesting ideas about medicine. This is um, a depiction of where they thought energy channels run through the body, the so-called meridians. That really is the backdrop to acupuncture, which is supposed to open up these energy channels. But the ancient Chinese were great experimentalists with, with herbs. And one of the herbs that, that uh, they used, Ma Wang is the way that they called it, today we recognize was really effective because it contains a, co contains a compound called ephedrine. This is a, a naturally occurring plant. Plants are composed of hundreds of different compounds. This particular one, contained ephedrine and ephedrine dilates the bronchial tubes and it also invigorates the heart. So there's no question that this could have been used for various kinds of respiratory problems. And indeed it is even around today. Ephedrine can be used, uh, someone has <clears throat> very low blood pressure. 
but uh, it no longer is uh, allowed to be sold over the counter because the um, toxic dose is too close to the therapeutic dose, but it is available by, by prescription. Uh, however, it has been superseded by better uh, asthma drugs. The ancient Chinese also knew about a plant called Artemisia annua, uh, which had um, all kinds of claimed therapeutic properties, but believe it or not, one of those properties has turned out to be very, very valuable because an extract of this plant can be processed into a medication. And that medication is a treatment for malaria. And it is used today in the world. Interestingly enough, a Nobel Prize was awarded to Professor Yu Yu Tu in China uh, for her work on uh, bringing back this ancient Chinese remedy and uh, identifying the compound that is present in the plant and uh, determining that it actually be you can be used to treat um, disease, specifically uh, malaria. So here we have a very ancient Chinese remedy that turns out to have a modern day application. <laughs> However, I, I think I should also point out that most of the traditional Chinese remedies, and there have been legions of them, hundreds, most of them have not turned out to be valuable in the same, same way. <clears throat> the ancient uh, Egyptians also obviously were interested in, in matters of health. I mean, uh, you know, that's quite obvious that all civilizations were somehow bent on trying to, to find solutions to their health problems. But the ancient Egyptians believed that disease was caused by gods. That is, it was uh, some sort of, of uh, retribution for not having uh, worshiped the gods properly or for some kind of, of ill uh, behavior. And uh, they thought that uh, the gods could be uh, pacified sacrifices, etc. But that doesn't mean that they were also not interested in trying to solve the problem once someone was sick. It may have been caused by the gods, but that didn't mean that humans were unable to do something about it. And as we know from a document called the Ebers Papyrus, which was written around 1500 BC, the Egyptians explored all kinds of potential uh, treatments for, for disease. In this case, a remedy for asthma, herbs on hot bricks. Now, it's not clear from the Ebers Papyrus what those herbs were, but if it was something like uh, the ephedra, Ma Wang, that I talked about, this actually would have made sense. Uh, but uh, a remedy for blindness made of pig's eye, red ochre, and honey poured into the ear, uh, I don't think would have done much good. So there may have been some sensible bits of advice in the Ebers Papyrus, but most of it would not hold up scientifically. One, of course, in any discussion about the history of medicine, one has to pay homage to Hippocrates, who is widely regarded as the father of, of medicine. He lived in about the fourth century uh, BC. And his main contribution was that disease was uh, something going wrong in the body. And it might be due to something in the environment and it was possible to treat these conditions and disease was not caused by retribution from the gods. His idea was that the body had to be in balance for there to be status, state of health. And there were um, four humors, as they were called, that had to be in balance in the body uh, in order to uh, prevent illness. Blood, which was uh, thought to be made in the liver, yellow bile made in the gallbladder, black bile in the spleen, and phlegm in the lungs. And how could one bring these things into balance? If someone was sick, the idea was that somehow, you know, these, these fluids 
were out of balance in the body. His idea, interestingly enough, was food. He supposedly coined the phrase, let thy food be thy medicine, because different kinds of foods would be able to bring these humors back into, into balance. Actually, there is no documented evidence that Hippocrates ever said that. It is not in any of his writings. But of course, that doesn't mean that uh, he didn't say it. Um, it was reported by uh, many, many other doctors, of course, referencing you know, historical accounts, but you know, who knows which of those um, is true. But if he did say that, it was pretty clever because back in those days, they didn't know anything about how the body worked. They didn't know anything about medicine. They didn't know what was in food. So that would have been pretty clever. And of course, today we know that uh, nutrition plays a very important role in, in health. And uh, his idea was that health could be restored if it was lost by a proper diet because that would restore the humors. His uh, ideas were taken up by Galen, uh, who was of Greek origin, but uh, uh, really worked as a doctor in Rome, in ancient, ancient Rome. And what is really amazing about Galen is the influence that he had on Europe. For about the next 1500 years, his ideas uh, were sacrosanct and um, that's a long time, 1500 years, for there to be no significant evolution in, in, in medicine because everything was based on Galen's ideas. Now, Galen was a very, very interesting uh, personality. He actually did carry out dissections on uh, monkeys, mostly. He tried to learn something about how the body worked. That was the first time that anyone had, had done that because generally dissections were frowned upon. Interestingly enough, he was also the first one to measure the pulse and uh, to be able to diagnose disease by changes in, uh, in the pulse. As far as treatments went, he was very much into cupping. And this is something that is still around today, where you take a, a, a jar, very often a glass jar, you heat up the air inside of it with a, with a candle, take out the candle and quickly clamp the jar on the skin. And as the air inside uh, contracts, it produces a vacuum, which sucks the skin into, into the cup. And the idea was that this would remove bad humors from the body. Of course, it doesn't do anything like that. The only thing it can do is leave you with a welt on the skin, but believe it or not, people still do practice this today although there is no scientific plausibility uh, to it. Galen also was very much into the use of herbal medicine, various kinds of plants, documented uh, his ideas in uh, various treatises that, that he wrote. And there were numerous formulations of all kinds of plants. And generally these would be mixed together so the Galenic concoctions were mixtures of all kinds of plants. He did make other contributions too. Believe it or not, he was the first one to introduce a cold cream. He blended together rose water, olive oil, and beeswax. And that was very, very similar to the cold creams, the moisturizing creams that, that we use today. But really the important uh, thing to remember about Galen is that uh, his influence lasted for you know, well over one and a half millennia, which is really quite, uh, quite amazing. Uh, medicine, of course, was, was uh, being explored all over the world, including in, in uh, Persia. And the most famous of the Persian uh, physicians was Avicenna in the 10th century. And, uh, he really introduced the idea that the body has to be treated as a whole and that uh, you, know, you, you can't concentrate on uh, just uh, using one specific substance 
to try to cure disease, you have to explore what else is going on. And that psych, uh, physical uh, explanations have to go side by side with psychological uh, explanations. He also suggested that diet was important in treating uh, patients. Again, this is over a thousand years ago. He also made a very important contribution technically. He was the one who discovered that you could distill plant materials, that if you heated them up, they would yield what we now call their essential oils. So he would mix together plant materials, add some water, start it all boiling, and then collect the vapors given off. And when those vapors cool down, this is what today we call the essential oil of that plant matter. And he made all kinds of medications uh, out of this. So the process of distillation, which of course turned out to have all kinds of interesting applications, including you know, after fermentation, uh, that was introduced by Evesana. Not much later, Maimonides uh, in Spain, a physician, and yeah, we know those days, I mean, there was no medical school as such. Uh, physicians declared themselves to be physicians or, you know, learned by apprenticing. Uh, my mom is a very interesting character because he believed that the broth of fowl was good for treating hemorrhoids, constipation, leprosy, and colds. Well, that's pretty interesting. What kind of broth of fowl was he talking about? Well, probably chicken soup. He also said, teach thy tongue to say, I do not know and thou shalt progress. That's a very important thing in science is that we don't know everything. And uh, we have to admit when we don't know something. But anyway, interesting thing about Maimonides is that he's kind of regarded as the, the uh, father of chicken soup therapy, often called Jewish penicillin, right? And uh, uh, Maimonides' writings are also very interesting because he was also very big on this idea that you have to treat the patient as a person and not just treat the disease. And today that is you know, what we refer to as holistic, holistic uh, medicine. Now, obviously society was plagued by disease back then because there basically was no cure for anything. So for example, the bubonic plague in the 14th century uh, devastated Europe. Estimates are that it could have killed about 50 million people, which was a very large percentage of the European population at that time. They didn't know what caused uh, the disease. I mean, obviously they didn't know anything about microbes back in, in those days. And uh, so they had all kinds of, of strange theories about what to do to counter disease. To get rid of the plague, it was necessary to break up the air. So church bells were rung, cannons were fired, canaries were kept to move the air. Obviously, none of that uh, made any sense whatsoever because the plague was caused by a parasite that was transmitted by fleas. And those fleas lived on rats. And the rat population, of course, was huge in those days because there was essentially no sanitation. Now, this was at a time when there was a lot of belief in, in all kinds of supernatural phenomena. People were superstitious. They believed in, in witches. And uh, very often, witches were thought to be the cause of disease. And ladies who were thought to be witches were persecuted. And uh, it was really horrific. Uh, I mean, you've you know, undoubtedly heard stories about, uh, well, in America, of course, there were the Salem witch trials uh, and in Europe uh, as well. Very similarly, a lot of people were accused of, of uh, being witches because when you don't have an explanation for how a disease comes to be, uh, 
then you come up with all of these, these crazy potential solutions. It was also believed that witches could transform themselves into animals. And black cats were very often thought to be witches in disguise. So one way to try to combat the plague was to kill the black cats, which they did. And of course, it didn't solve the problem. It made the problem worse because the cats were predators of the rats. And when the cats were killed, the rats multiplied and the fleas multiplied. Doctors could not do very much about the plague. They tried to protect themselves, although not exactly in the way that, uh, that people think. Yes, they did wear these masks. However, they did not wear the masks thinking that somehow they would be protecting themselves from inhaling something because they had no concept of that. The reason for the big beak there was that that would be filled with aromatic herbs because of the terrible stench of death that accompanied the plague. But you notice also the stick that he is carrying. And that was because they did understand that if they got too close to people who were suffering from the disease, then it could be transferred to them. They didn't understand how that could possibly be, but they did know that it was a good idea to keep away from sick people. So the doctor carried that stick so that no one would come close to him. But of course, they really had no treatments to offer at all. There was a lot of craziness in, in, in those days, you know, out of frustration of not being able to solve problems. And then you resort to all kinds of things. So for example, in this uh, painting, somewhat humorous by Hieronymus Bosch in 1494, you can see the doctor with the funnel on his, uh, on his head, removing the stone of madness from the patient's head. Now this goes back to you know, the likes of trepanation, where it was believed that, it, that there was something mechanically wrong in the head you know, that was gumming up the machinery, such as a stone. And they were trying to remove the stone that they thought caused the madness. Now we come to Paracelsus in the uh, 16th century. Paracelsus was one of the most interest, interesting sages, alchemist, physician, philosopher, I think who has ever lived. He was um, born in, um, uh, in Switzerland. Paracelsus was not his real name. Para means beyond. Celsus was an ancient Roman physician. So Theophastus von Hohenheim, which was his real name, thought that he was better than Celsus had been. So he adopted the name Paracelsus, meaning beyond Celsus. And he wrote extensively. Paracelsus railed against the doctrine of humors. He didn't think that there was anything there that you know, disease did not come about because of an imbalance in humors. And he really exhorted experimentation that in order to learn about anything, you had to try experiments. And he introduced specific chemical treatments for disease. Now, it's not that they worked well because they really didn't. For example, he introduced mercury as a treatment for syphilis. So that didn't really work well. But the idea was that there were specific substances that could be used to treat specific diseases. And he opposed Galen's polypharmacy, where everything was just put together in one concoction. So he said that there were specifics. Whereas, you know, in those days, uh, herbalists would mix up all kinds of, of plants together to come up with a remedy. But what Paracelsus was most famous for 
was his uh, doctrine about sola dosis facit venenum. And for those of you who have forgotten your Latin, only the dose makes the poison. And with that, he laid the cornerstone of toxicology because we know that it is critical when looking at the toxicity or indeed the therapeutic potential of a substance, it is critical to know the amounts. So here was something that was quite scientific. But again, this was an age where scientific plausibility mixed together with total nonsense. For example, around the same time, uh, there was belief in the so-called powder of sympathy as described in this book here. The idea here was that if you were injured by a sword or, a, or some kind of a, a spear, the way to treat that was to put the medication not on the wound, but on the weapon that had caused it. So if you had a cut with a sword, you had to find the sword that did the damage and put the powder of sympathy on it. This of course was absolute nonsense, but it was an age of nonsense where quacks were plying their trade on street corners, selling all of their bogus uh, nostrums because of course there was no chemical analysis. Nobody really knew what was in all of these things. It was very primitive, but very often they would mix in some opium and that would make people feel better. This was also at a time when if you were sick, you were likely to be desanguinated, that is bloodletting. Bloodletting had been going on since, since um, oh, well before the ancient Greek and Roman era for, for thousands of years, it, it had been uh, going on because the idea was that if you were sick, it is because you were harboring some unknown entity that was making you sick in the blood and if you just release the blood, you'd get better. Of course, that didn't work, uh, but that never stopped people from bloodletting. Why? Because of the power of the mind. If you think it does some good, you, it changes your perception of the disease. Bloodletting was very often done by barbers. This is the reason that the barber's pole still has that red stripe on it. The red stripe represented blood. And you'd go to the barber, not only for shaving or, or hair cutting, you would go to the barber uh, if you had any kind of, of a boil to be removed or you had a cut that had to be sewn up, uh, the barber would do that. If you had a toothache, you would go to the barber and they would pull out your tooth. Remember that all of this was done without any kind of anesthesia. Tooth pulling was a very, very common thing because there was nothing that you could do other than pull out a, a, a painful tooth. And uh, you just had to, to put up with the pain. With the pulling of a teeth, the pain was somewhat temporary. But imagine when they would um, you know, have to cauterize a wound with a hot iron or do an amputation, which they would do because they knew that if uh, gangrene developed in an arm or a leg, then the person would die. The only way was to remove the limb. But imagine that without any kind of uh, anesthesia. As I said, this was an era of sense and nonsense. So let's get back to the sense. William Harvey. Scottish physician who is credited with the theory or at least demonstrating uh, circulation in the body. Now, before this, it was quite widely believed that blood was manufactured in, in the liver. William Harvey showed that blood actually circulated throughout the body and uh, that it went through the lungs, it went through the arms, it went through the legs, and it was all one big circulatory system. And uh, that really was a, a major uh, step forward in understanding how the body worked. Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, 
manufactured or produced the first microscope. Now, it didn't look the way that you would think a microscope looks. This was the original microscope, and there's a very small lens in there, and the lens was focused on, on the, uh, uh, the pin that you see here, and anything put on the tip of the pin would be magnified. So they were able to, to look at some very interesting things through this microscope. Of course, they didn't really know what they were looking at. Leeuwenhoek didn't know what he was looking at. He described what he saw in a droplet of water as little animalcules. Now today, of course, we know that what he was looking at was bacteria. But to him, it looked like little animals. He never was able to relate that to, to disease. But he deserves credit, of course, for being the first one to observe the existence of, of such microscopic life. Disease was rampant in uh, ancient times. I mean, in Middle Ages, you know, average life expectancy was in the 30s. Uh, there were all kinds of, of infectious diseases. One of the worst was smallpox. And uh, if you got these pox, these little growths on the body, uh, you were going to die. And uh, it was thanks to Edward Jenner that we began to see some survival in people who had smallpox. And he had made a very, very interesting observation. He noticed that milkmaids, these were the ladies who milked cows, would sometimes develop a condition that was known as cowpox. So they would develop these boils on their body. But the interesting observation that he made was that the women who got cowpox never got smallpox. This gave him an idea that somehow there was something protective about the cowpox. And he hatched a clever little scheme whereby he took some liquid from the cowpox postules and he injected this into the bloodstream of a young boy well, actually didn't inject it, he made a little incision and he put the, this pussy material onto the injection. And he thought that this would be protective against smallpox, the same way that, that the uh, milkmaids were protected. So he introduced this into the bloodstream of the little boy and then he exposed them to smallpox because they understood of course that it was a contagious disease. And indeed it turned out that the boy did not get the disease. And this was the beginning of vaccination. The term itself comes from the Latin vacca, meaning cow, because that's where the idea came from. You would think that suffering from this terrible disease, smallpox, that the public would immediately jump on this bandwagon and accept vaccination. But such was not the case. All kinds of cartoons showed the, the idea. And you can see these poor people here who have been inoculated have cows growing out of their body. Very similar to what is going on today with the anti-vax movement. They just couldn't understand that doing something like that, inserting something into the bloodstream uh, would not be harmful, especially when it came from, from an animal. And it took some while until the concept of vaccination against smallpox was accepted. accepted. And of course, it proved its mettle. And uh, it is the one disease that has been wiped off the face of the earth because of vaccination. The last recorded case of smallpox was in, in 1978. So this is something that we no longer have to worry about thanks to vaccination. Also around the same time, William Withering, another Scottish physician, Scots provided uh, a lot of very good science in, in those days. And you see William Withering here holding uh, a branch. Now that is not just a random branch. 
what you're looking at there is uh, a branch taken from the foxglove plant because William Withering had followed up on a so-called old wives tale. And I know these days you're not supposed to use that expression. I mean, someone took me to task over that uh, because I was using the expression old wife, but that's what they called it in those days. They didn't call it old person's tale or old man's tale. They called it uh, old wife's tale. And uh, he had um, investigated a lady uh, who was giving a concoction brewed up from the foxglove plant to sick people who had been complaining about heart problems. And uh, Withering questioned her, he followed up on this and organized a clinical trial whereby he actually gave the foxglove extract to some of his heart patients and didn't give it to others, compared the outcome and it found that the foxglove worked and it still works because one of the compounds that is found in foxglove is used today, digoxin, as a treatment for congestive heart failure. Now, of course, doctors don't go telling uh, patients to graze in a field of foxglove. The active ingredient is isolated, it's purified, quant and you know, it can be administered quantitatively. The dosages are, are, are known. So while William Withering was carrying out this work in Scotland over on this side of the, the pond, William Beaumont did a fascinating study for which he has been named the father of gastric physiology. It was sort of a lucky uh, happenstance because a patient came to see him who had a terrible accident. He had been shot accidentally with a shotgun in the belly. Uh, it didn't do all that much harm, but it did make a hole in his belly. And William Beaumont administered to him. He cleaned the wound, but he was unable to close it. But this gave him an idea. He now had a window into the gastric system. And he began a series of experiments with Alexis Saint Martin. He was a Quebecois. And uh, this man had a hole in his uh, gut through which Beaumont was able to extract some fluid, gastric juice. And he studied the effect of that gastric juice on different foods. And this really was the beginning understanding the process of, of digestion from this happy accident, I guess not so happy for Alexis St. Martin, but pretty happy for Beaumont uh, because he, he was just able to, to study what goes on in the, uh, in the digestive tract. Well, going back across the ocean, we uh, come into the lab of Franz Anton Mesmer. Mesmer was a young physician graduating medical school. I mean, having learned, you know, what you learned in those days, how to bleed patients, how to purge patients. He didn't like that. He didn't think he was doing his patients very much good. He was also interested in magnets. He found them to be very fascinating, which of course they are. I mean, you put a magnet on one side of your hand, you put a piece of metal on the other and it's attracted. Something is going through the body. So he thought that perhaps magnets could attract disease out of the body. And he set up a healing salon whereby people would hold on to magnetized rods as indicated here and uh, be treated for diseases. And a lot of them said that they felt much better. This of course was the placebo effect in action. If you think that you are better, very often you are, at least in terms of perception. The placebo does not cure anything. It just changes the way that you perceive the disease. It can be very effective for painful conditions, but again, you have to remember it, it doesn't solve the underlying uh, uh, problem. And of course, we still remember Mesmer today because of the term Mesmerism, which is very often used as a synonym for hypnosis. And that's because Mesmer found that you didn't really need the metal rods 
that healthy people were able to exude animal magnetism, as he called it. And all you had to do was be close to someone who was young and healthy, and they would be able to heal you. And uh, this is really the beginning of, of mesmerism, hypnosis. Uh, he even suggested that when it didn't work, some of these ladies had to be taken to a back room for further treatment. He didn't really specify what that treatment, treatment uh, was. But Mesmer really deserves some credit for establishing the body-mind relationship. René Lanec in France deserves credit for yet another discovery. What is the uh, hallmark of a physician these days? It's the stethoscope. And Lanec is the one who introduced that device, but didn't look anything like the stethoscopes look today. It was a piece of hollow wood tubing that he would use to listen to people's breaths and to heart. And this came about in a very interesting way because one day he was asked to administer to a lady who was uh, uh, rather well endowed. And he was very hesitant about putting his uh, ears to her chest. So he came up with an idea where he just rolled up a piece of paper and he listened through that. And he knew something about sound because his hobby was making flutes. So that's how the first stethoscope came about. And of course, it was much refined uh, later, but Lanek gets the credit for the discovery. In England, John Snow, who was the physician to Queen Victoria, had a problem. The problem that he was asked to look into was cholera. And cholera was rampant in London, particularly in one area of the city. And Snow took a map of that area of the city and he pinpointed all of the houses where someone was suffering from cholera. And he found that it all centered around Broad Street. He went to have a look and he found what there was in Broad Street. There was a pump and he figured that somehow this pump was dispensing death. He didn't really know how because he didn't know anything about microbiology. It was just an empirical finding that death was centered around that pump. So he asked the mayor to remove the handle of the pump. Mayor of course thought he was crazy, but he insisted they remove the handle of the pump and slowly the epidemic subsided, although it had already begun to subside before the handle was removed. If you get a chance to go to London, uh, there's a replica of that pump. It stands there in Broad Street. And of course, it doesn't have a handle to demonstrate what removal of the handle did. Uh, also, just at the corner there is the John Snow pub, where not very much water is consumed. Well, of course, today we know what caused uh, cholera. It was a uh, bacterium, but they had no idea of that in those days. Of course, they had no idea of the whole germ theory of disease until Louis Pasteur came along. And he, of course, is widely recognized uh, as being the, the father of, of uh, bacteriology and the germ theory of, uh, of disease. He was the first one to actually sh show that uh, there were these small organisms, various kinds of microbes that could be present in water, could be present in blood that caused disease. And he also showed that there were ways to get around this. Of course, he figured out the process of pasteurization, meaning that these microbes could be destroyed by, by heat. But uh, he also furthered uh, Jenner's ideas about vaccination, introducing a vaccine against uh, rabies. So Pasteur's real contribution, of course, was the establishment of the germ theory of disease, which had <clears throat> very, very quick uh, results because in, uh, in England, Joseph Lister, who was a, a very, very uh, famous surgeon at that time, 
heard about Pasteur's ideas about disease being caused by uh, microbes. And he had had constant difficulty with people getting infections during surgery. And he thought that maybe this was because Pasteur's microbes uh, were present in the air when he was doing surgery on, on sick people. He also found that you were able to kill these microbes using an apparatus that you see on the, on the table here. He would spray this into the air thinking that, that you know, if you could disinfect the air, you could kill these uh, microbes. And uh, this was um, a little device that was filled with phenol. And phenol is an antiseptic. He came to this conclusion in a very, very interesting way because uh, in those days, uh, cesspools, which of course were all over the city, stank and sewers stank. And often municipalities would try to, to do something about the stench by pouring into their uh, petroleum extracts. They, found ex they just found empirically that that would reduce the smell. And Lister discovered that it was this compound that occurred in petroleum called phenol that was responsible for eliminating the smell. And now we know why, because it killed uh, bacteria responsible for the smell. So he introduced this phenol spray uh, that was sprayed around the operating room and that cut down infections. And then in Hungary, Ignat Semmelweis uh, also came to an interesting conclusion about these microbes, although again, he really didn't understand what, what was going on. Uh, he, of course, was the one who introduced hand washing. He found that uh, women in childbirth were more likely to develop purpural fever, which could be deadly, when they were uh, administered to by doctors than by nurses. And it turned out that it was because the doctors would have sometimes come from doing autopsies and never washed their hands. The nurses never did uh, autopsies. And he concluded that the doctors were bringing something in with them. So he asked them to wash hands. At that time, it seemed like this was far-fetched because of course, you know, there was nothing visible on, uh, on the hands. And uh, obviously uh, the experiment very quickly showed that the incidence of purpura fever went way down when doctors washed their uh, hands. But there was one huge problem that was very difficult to deal with and that was the problem of pain. Because of course they would do surgeries, they could remove limbs, but the patient had to be held down or tied down. Although in the 1800s, laughing gas nitrous oxide became available uh, and it was useful in, in dentistry, uh, but uh, uh, if you're going to saw off someone's leg, nitrous oxide is not going to, to counter that, that pain. And this is when William Morton came along and he introduced ether as an anesthetic with a very simple device. It was a piece of sponge in a jar. The sponge would be saturated with ether and it would be inhaled. And there's this classic painting of the first ever surgery carried out under ether anesthesia, the removal of an external tumor uh, from uh, the neck of a patient. And you'll notice also that uh, the doctors would get dressed up in their finery to do operations in those days. Again, they really didn't know about uh, antisepsis. But you also see in this picture here, William Horton holding the ether inhaler. The same year that this operation was being done in uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, over in England, William Henry Perkin made an interesting discovery that at first does not seem like having to do anything with medicine. He discovered synthetic dyes. He was the first one to make mauve, which was a brand new, new color. It was an accidental discovery. He was actually trying to make quinine in the lab to treat malaria, uh, but he accidentally made a synthetic dye called mauve. And this had a big impact on, on medicine. Robert Koch in, um, in Germany was a bacteriologist. He had followed in the footsteps of Pasteur. And by these days, microscopes had become quite sophisticated. 
But the problem was that when you were trying to look at bacteria through the microscope, it was very difficult to see them against a background that was transparent. So Koch heard about Perkins dyes and he wondered if he could dye the bacteria so they would be more visible under the microscope. And he did. The bacteria were more easily seen with these synthetic dyes. He was able to identify a number of bacteria, including the one that caused tuberculosis. And for this, Robert Koch uh, got the 1905 Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology, because this was a huge breakthrough, the identification of a bacterium that caused tuberculosis. But he was only able to do that because he was able to see the bacterium because it had been dyed with Perkins dye. Interesting enough, Robert Koch had a laboratory assistant, Julius Richard Petri. And those of you who've done any kind of biology will know of the Petri dish. And this is the dish that is still used today to grow bacteria. And um, uh, this was uh, all under Koch's tutelage. Uh, once they had been able to look at bacteria under the microscope, they were able to uh, culture bacteria and see whether or not the bacteria could be killed. So this was really the beginning of, of, of uh, bacterial uh, or antibiotic therapy, at least the concept of antibiotic therapy. This was furthered by Paul Ehrlich, who also worked with, with Koch, received the 1908 Nobel Prize. And this also had to do with dyes because Ehrlich thought, gee, you know, if certain bacteria can uptake the dye so that you see them better through the microscope, what if we were able to come up with a dye that was toxic? Would it kill the bacteria? And out of that thought process came what we can regard as the world's first antibiotic, which was Salversan. What uh, Ehrlich did was to take a dye very similar to what Perkin had made and blend into it some arsenic because he knew that arsenic was poisonous. So it turned out that this concoction called arsphenamine actually could kill bacteria. It's a very interesting story. There was even a movie made about it starring Edward G. Robinson, Dr. Ehrlich's magic bullet. And as Ehrlich was developing his magic bullet, a physicist by the name of William Röntgen found that x-rays could penetrate the body, but not metals and not bones. And of course, this was a huge jump forward in the uh, progress of, of medicine. Drugs, which of course today are the mainstay of medicine. And in the late 1800s, aspirin appeared. Uh, aspirin was um, synthesized by Felix Hoffman, a chemist uh, working for the uh, Bayer company. I'm not sure why he had himself uh, pictured here holding a paper bag. I don't know what's, what's in there. But anyway, uh, the idea for aspirin takes us all the way back to Hippocrates because Hippocrates had suggested making a brew from the bark of the willow tree for pain and fever. And that worked because the bark of the willow tree contains a compound called salicin. The problem is that salicin was very irritating to the stomach. And Hoffman's father had arthritis and he was taking salicin extracted from willow bark, but his stomach was, was terrible. And uh, so his son, uh, Hoffman, decided that he was going to just alter the structure of salicin to see if he could improve upon it and take away the gastric problem. And he combined salicin with, with uh, uh, acetic acid and in fact, he came up with aspirin, the name coming from a, the Latin means from, and spirin, which was the Latin name for willow. And this is where this misconception comes from that aspirin is extracted from the willow tree. It's not. The idea came from the willow tree. Uh, the Bayer company started to sell aspirin uh, and it sold uh, very, very well. Uh, it became a, a famous, uh, especially, <laughs> It was sold alongside of heroin, believe it or not. Heroin at that time, also introduced by Hoffman, was not thought to be a problem. 
today, of course, we know that uh, this is, uh, of course, one of society's scourges. While Bayer was making legitimate aspirin, there were also all kinds of bogus remedies on the market at that time. This was the patent medicine era, when you had things like Hamlin's wizard oil and Pratt's healing ointment, uh, supposedly cures for everything. This was the era of snake oil, when anyone could sell anything. And Sir William Osler, who of course we do have to mention because of his McGill connection, was certainly against the use of those uh, uh, patent drug, patent medicines. He was essentially against the use of medicine too, but he was extremely important in the history of medicine because he introduced residency programs. He said that students have to go to the bedside. That's where you have to learn medicine, not from books and not from lectures even though he himself wrote one of the most famous textbooks in, in, in medicine. He is perhaps most famous for saying that the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. That was Osler. And uh, Osler did not think much of medicines in those days, understandably, because most medicines were not very good. And he said one of the prime duties of physician is to educate the masses, not to take medicine. Canada even issued a stamp uh, for Osler because of his contributions to medical education and the introduction of, of clinical medicine that students in their third and fourth year already have to go to the bedside. And he introduced a residency program, which is sort of a pyramid scheme whereby uh, students teach those below them, which is still in use today. Another very important Canadian contribution was, of course, insulin. Uh, and insulin was uh, researched at the University of Toronto by Charles Best and Frederick Banting, recipient, uh, or at least Banting was recipient of the 23, uh, 1923 Nobel Prize in Medicine. Best was not included, which was uh, uh, is really wrong. Uh, he should have been uh, included. Uh, Banting received the Nobel Prize together with McLeod, who was just the director of the laboratory, who really didn't have very much to do with the discovery. But this was perhaps Canada's greatest contribution to, to medicine. Alexander Fleming, of course, in 1928, uh, had a very happy accident when he noticed that a mold was growing in a Petri dish and in which he was studying bacteria and the bacteria died around the mold. He thought the mold was producing something that killed the bacteria. He was unable to isolate it. But Howard Florey and Ernst Chain in England eventually did isolate, of course, what came to be called penicillin. That was 10 years later. The question was, how do you produce enough of it? That task was given to Norman Heatley and he came up with a way of mass producing penicillin in fermentation tanks, the job was given to the so-called penicillin girls. And here you can see the, uh, the tanks that were used in the penicillin fermentation. They were actually modeled on bedpans. The trouble was that the mold that they had did not produce a high dose of penicillin. So the search was on to find a better mold. And that search paid off in Peoria, Illinois, of all places, where a cantaloupe was found. And a mold on that cantaloupe produced more penicillin than any other penicillin mold. And this was commercialized. Uh, the first production vessels were large milk cans, made a huge impact on history. And uh, penicillin uh, was available for the Allies during the Second World War, uh, which uh, helped turn the tide of, of battle. And uh, Fleming, Chain, and Flory shared the 1945 uh, Nobel Prize in medicine for the introduction of penicillin. Other antibiotics came quickly. Salmon Waxman in, in New Jersey at Rutgers University, 1952, got the Nobel Prize for isolating from the throat of a sick chicken a drug that 
came to be called streptomycin. It was the first drug really effective against tuberculosis. And then a huge step was taken, not by physicians, but by two chemists, Francis Crick and James Watson, who of course unraveled the secret of DNA and uh, that basically you know, uh, introduced the whole idea of, of uh, drugs that, that could somehow have an effect on, on, uh, on genes and the whole concept of genetic engineering. This was a huge breakthrough. There were other breakthroughs, of course, in surgery as well. Dr. Chris Barnard uh, transplanted a heart into uh, a dentist, Washansky, lived for a few weeks. Today, of course, people with heart transplants live long lives. Paul Lauterbur, Peter Mansfield, two physicists, uh, introduced the idea of magnetic resonance imaging. And of course, MRI machines today are mainstays in hospitals. Well, at this point, you know, it, uh, there was such an explosion of developments in medicine that, that it's impossible to, to you know, even uh, put them into a short uh, version. I mean, there were hundreds of drugs that have been developed since the 1940s. Surgical equipment has become much, much more modern. Radiation therapy has uh, you know, uh, advanced tremendously. And uh, most recently, uh, Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman, University of, of Pennsylvania, uh, laid the foundations for messenger RNA treatments and, of course, the vaccine that we have uh, come to know so well and speak so much of. And uh, that's it, because there's just so much, you know, since the 1940s and 1950s that has happened in medicine that it's almost impossible to pick out, uh, you know, specifics. But I hope that, uh, you know, we've given you a little picture here about the evolution of medicine uh, over the few thousand years. And uh, of course, uh, no matter what, uh, and no matter what sort of medical miracles researchers come up with, we know that you don't get out of life alive. All we can hope to do is to make life more pleasant and perhaps give us a few extra years before we meet the end, which is of course also an appropriate place for us to meet our end for today. Thank so, you so much, Dr. Schwartz. We are now open to questions. Oh. Yvonne Dumoulin says, what about Mary Curie's contribution? Well, Mary Curie, uh, had a huge contribution, of course, to science in, in terms of uh, radioactivity. But her work did not have a direct uh, application to medicine. It certainly had a direct application to, you know, unraveling the theory of the atom and to eventually leading to uh, therapy involving radioactive substances. But she didn't have anything to, to do with that. Um, her connection really was that she developed leukemia from exposure to the, the uh, polonium that she was uh, working with. Great question. We're going to give people a minute. I don't see any further questions. I think uh, it's a lot to take in. It's a sweep of the entire history of medicine. It is a lot. <laughs> and I think next next month we'll have a topic that probably will generate questions. We're going to talk about uh, cancer and various treatments, and especially, uh, unfortunately, the all all the quack treatments that are out there claiming to help people with cancer. Oh, we have a final question, Jonas Salk. Oh, yes. Uh, Jonas Salk, of course, uh, uh, polio vaccine. Yeah, I, I really should have had polio in there. Yeah, I really should have, because that uh, certainly was a, a huge advance. Uh, 
uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, that was in the 40s and the 50s. And uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, almost in North America wiped out polio because of the, uh, of the vaccines. Yeah, I, yeah, that was, uh, that should have been in there for sure. Thank you so much, everyone. And we can't wait to see you for our next presentation next month. Thank okay. you so much, Dr. Schwartz. Have yeah. a great day. Bye. Bye.